Hello, and welcome to In Theory, what is the last of this year's four random books. Again, being recorded in the 30th of August. So, next week I start on next year's. The plan is to have as many recorded as possible, so it just keeps... One coming, and one of these comes out every single week. Every Wednesday, 12 o'clock British time, it comes out 12 p.m. Should be nice. And this one is called Freeman Does the British Navy. And it's quite simple. Norm Freeman's British Carrier Aviation. Norman Freeman's British Cruisers in Two World Wars. And Arthur. Norman Freeman's British Submarines in Two World Wars. Norman Freeman's British Destroyers and Frigates. The Second World War and Arthur. I'm limited to four books. And honestly, if we want to get even try and get this done in 15 minutes, honestly, I should probably have limited myself to two books. But I'm trying for four and 15, and this is the last of this year. So I have a remaining of 13 minutes and 10 seconds to get this done. So wish me luck. British Destroyers and Frigates. It's a gorgeous book. All by Norman Freeman. Lots and lots of pictures. Lots and lots of technical writing. My view is always the same with Norman Freeman. He does colossal books. Yes, you can find errors. But they are massive. And if you want a starting place, the foundation block for so much work, probably a large chunk of the work done behind me, a large chunk of the work done in front of me, it is Norman Freeman's colossal tomes. With the five-inch gun dead by October 1953, this naval staff was planning a 3,600-ton escort destroyer which would be laid down in 1957-8. In the autumn of 1953, DTSD and the Ship Design Policy Committee discussed a possible multi-role destroyer, probably on the basis of the study described above of the modernised daring. John estimated in mid-October that the ship would be about 4,400 tonnes. DTSD concluded no such ship was practical. 4,400 tonnes was too large for a screening ship. Future fleet escorts would have to be specialised. However, work continued for a time. The larger tonnage allowed for the Swedish ten, twin 4.7-inch, already in use with the Dutch Navy, which DNO favoured as a replacement for the defunct 5-inch. A British version would be heavier because it would incorporate features such as shock hardening, flash zones, automatic chemical protection, in improved habitability, habitability uh, spraying arrangements, and mechanical hopper loading in the, the magazine. On the 22nd of July, 1954, John ordered a quick study of a ship with three such mounts, capable of 30.5 knots deep and dirty, with daring class endurance. In effect, this was the modernised daring of the new gun. Secondary armament was two twin LL-70. The fire control system employed four MRS-3 directors, four channel GDS-3, and a separate simplified director. The tachymetric one-man director. Tom. The ship would also have the 12 fixed torpedo tubes and 8 reloads and the single limbo of the contemporary AS fast escort. Total estimated weight, weight armor, and total estimated armor weight was 660 tons. John proposed using the new Y102 steam gas turbine power plant. Minimum length would be 415 feet to achieve 30.5 knots deep and dirty. The estimated deep load was 4,250 tons. This, that was a great deal, so John also tried two 12 centimeter mounts on 4,000 uh, 4, tons, and then a ship with a single mount and one L-70 twin on 3,500 tons, roughly comparable to the fleet and the submarine escort described below. The designers concluded that the 3,500-ton, 375-foot, and 4,000-ton, 400-foot ships would be quite practical, with speeds of 31 knots and 30.5 knots, and the endurance of depth being daring at 4,400 nautical miles at 20 knots, respectively. The three mount ship would probably grow beyond 4,250 tons. Two mount design seemed to be the best all round proposition. Always an interesting book to read, this one. Right, how long do I have? Oh, good lord, it's almost a, a 10 minutes and I've got three books to go. Right, so British submarines in two world wars and after. I'd love this book. I really do use it a lot and I love its pictures. 
It ha it's one of the few books in his range which seems to have these great fold-out designs. Not all these books do have this sort of thing, and this one has it. So in many ways, it's kind of like the John Brown, you know, studies. The great big design books, which I like to show off and like to read. This is just gorgeous. Let's see. Uh, second one of all we'll go to, and we'll go to this one. Further, our A-boat is better than a T, but only has a blown supercharged T-boat engine with a couple of extra parts. It handles much better than a T, dives easy to 600 feet test depth, and I should say 800 foot is within its limits. It is undergunned. It should have a twin 4-inch and a 40 millimeter. In order to get speed without engine power, again, engine production are bottleneck, the torpedo rooms fore and aft have been fitted, uh, been fine to uncomfortable limits. It is two externals and four dry internals board with six reloads, and two externals and two internal stone loads, stern tubes, with four reloads. It is 30 tons more displacement, thinner and longer than the T. The radar periscope, which you can't see through, it being a Type 267, a sort of 3cm ST reflector on a periscope tube, gives you range and bearing and draws out on a PPI. It has troubles, but a future. The A is a wartime design to utilise existing and available material. It is not an outstanding new design at all. It looks rather like a German U-boat with standards for 40-foot sticks. T-boat, S-boat equals 34, but uh, the control room is a fair compromise. A brilliant brain, having had a some say, but not ideal. All the CO stuff is on the starboard side, and all the submarining stuff on the port side, so that you don't have the first lieutenant talking to the outside ERA across the captain talking to his fruit machine. It was hoped to put in an American data computer and angling, but this has not yet arrived, and anyhow, that it, there is not enough room for some of it. I do not know if it will turn out well, but it seemed to handle nicely submerged and is singly free from vibration. Our future designs will evolve around closed cycle propulsion, intelligent torpedoes, submerged endurance act in the submarine with a future. I must think few, for, I amongst few think, for the dual purpose submersible as well. Don't think that I'm too proud to learn from the Americans, who are the most charming people to work under, and do not suffer from our equipment troubles, but our boats do not do not compare badly as fighting machines, and I know which I would rather have taken into the inland sea. Actually, I reckon that the outstanding SM of this war is the German 500 tonner, top of the sinking tonnage too, and fought to the last. What are we at? Oof. Seven minutes to go. Very good book. Right. British Cruisers. Two World Wars and Arthur by Norman Freeman. This is a glorious book. That's on many of his books. Um, still has my C4 publishing things in it. I can use them as bookmarks. So, some glorious pictures in here. Some random pieces of paper as well used. That's various things. I prefer... Of course, being me, the earlier periods. And here is the London class. So Euston Tennis, uh, Eustace Tennyson at the Enercott, retired as DNC at the end of 1923, being succeeded by William J. Berry, who had led the county class design team. As he entered office, Berry wondered whether he could have produced a better treaty cruiser, for example, using triple turrets. He assigned Lily Cap, the name actually is Lily Crap. To investigate an alternate design, an alternative design with three triple turrets instead of four twins, which DNO estimated would weigh about the same, or with four triples, as it was rumored the US Navy was planning, four triples would weigh around about 800 tons uh, rather than the 600 tons that estimated for the twins, and at 130 rounds per gun, extra ammunition would add another 105 tons. Magazines, shell rooms, and handling rooms would be larger, so the armor covering them would weigh more and would cost fuel space. Lily Crap set that at 95 more tons for a total increase of 400 tons. He could claw almost all of that back by shaving protection over the machinery and by eliminating the torpedo battery and the steering gear protection. Unfortunately, the wider magazines would run up against the sh uh, shafting aft. They could be made narrower but longer, adding some armor weight, which could be offset by further caps uh, cuts in machinery protection. Lillycrap also suggested shrinking the machinery spaces by cutting back to six boilers. 
60,000 ship horsepower. They would make up for oil tankage loss to enlarge the magazine, so the ship would carry 3,290 tons of oil, and she could still make the desirable 8,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. The Leary Crap study seems to have been a basis for DNC's first approach to designing the next cruiser class for 1925-6. At the end of the July 1924, DNC suggested for the 1925-6 cruisers an entirely new design with four triple eight inch but with no protection and no bulge, and a speed of at least 34 knots, attainable perhaps on 100,000 ship horsepower. Armed with his earlier study, Lillycrap estimated the armament weight would, incre would increase by about 300 tons, admitting the bulge would save 150 tons, it's a par a partly balanced by heavier turret foundations and larger magazines. The net saving would be 65 tons on the 5,600-ton Kent hull. That saving would roughly balance increased hull weights due to the larger power plant, by this time, more precise estimates were at hand for Kent weights. So Lily Crap could be confident that her machinery weighed 1,686 tons. He took 1,700 tons. He took the same equipment weight as in Kent, knowing that it should be could be cut somewhat. Most of the armor weight of the early ships could be applied to machinery, which could weigh, uh, weigh as much as 2,530 tons, about 2,340 tons of E and C machinery. Lenny Crap thought uh, that would easily provide him with the 110,000 ship horsepower needed to achieve 34 knots. Hazlar curve showed 55 EHP to reach 34 knots at 10,000 tons. Lily Crap also considered a 120,000 ship horsepower plant. That new, the new ship would have a third boiler room. The slight estimates complete in mid uh, September 1924 showed that 110 tons could be left for protection. Enough for very limited deck armor of the magazines. Since this was unacceptable, DNC was driven back to four twin 8 inch guns. In mid October, he asked how much protection that would buy, keeping the high power. He found that he could not get good enough magazine, a good magazine protection, which was much the same conclusion reflected in previous years' X, Y, and Z designs. Three minutes. Good one. British Carrier Aviation. The Evolution of the Ships and Their Aircraft by Norman Freeman. This is slightly Americocentric in terms of its perspective on British development, but it is good and is encompassing. Throughout the 1920s, the British government tried to reduce the prospective cost of defence by further limiting warship size by treaty. In the spring of 1926, for example, it considered proposing a new limit of 23,000 tons at the forthcoming 1927 Geneva Convention. The Naval Air Section and Naval Staff needed a confirmation that a new carrier, arranged as courageous, should, could accommodate about 50 aircraft and achieve at least 30 knots on this displacement. The then DNC, Berry, suggested that more mach modern machinery could actually add about one and a half knots, 120,000 horsepower versus 90,000 uh, ship horsepower, but that the new ship would be relatively unprotected. Her underwater protection would not equal that on a new, contempor on a new contemporary submarine depot ship, and her decks would be penetrated by relatively small bombs. Barry wanted to add about 1,000 tons of protection and considered 24,000 tons a better limit, with 25,000 tons really satisfactory to take into account new developments. In July 1927, uh, the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, ACNS, reviewed required numbers uh, in hopes of further cuts. He suggested that a single carrier only in the home and Mediterranean fleets would be acceptable from a tactical point of view, so that the wartime modern total could be reduced to four ships. On 22,500 tons, approximately, the tonnage of Courageous, a ship could accommodate as bad as many air aircraft, 52, about the same flying facilities, and it could achieve 30 knots deep load with about the endurance of HMS Nelson. From a treaty point of view, this was very attractive, as four carriers could cost for much less than five. They would accommodate fewer aircraft in total, which would cost less to buy and to man. This logic will be familiar to any student of recent attempts at arms limitation. The problem was that carriers were somewhat more than a simple drain on national purse. They were required for operational duties. For example, if the life of a carrier were taken as 24 years, two of those years would be taken up in refits. Thus, although the Navy list might show four carriers, during eight years, at least one would be away at all times for an effective force of three. It, also, it was also argued that three carriers were inadequate from a tactical point of view. One compromise was to retain five ships, but keep only four in commission, rotating the others through refits. A reduction to 22,500 tons was also attractive from this point of view, as the Washington Treaty a total of 135,000 tons would accommodate six such ships, compared to five 27,000 ton ships. 
if in fact there was little to choose in aircraft capacity or sea keeping between 22,500 and 27,000 tons, the greater number of ships was quite attractive from a tactical point of view. At this time, it seemed likely that Japan would press for a reduction of 90,000 tons of carriers, in which case Britain would retain four of the 22,500 tons each. In the event that five were required, then the global limit would be usually be set at 115,000 tons. That would leave Britain and the United States without much excess tonnage. Japan would probably object, since she would be left with 15,500 tons on a 553 basis. Not quite enough to build an efficient ship. The Amity planners reached the conclusion that a satisfactory carrier could be built on 22,500 to 23,000 tons but that it would be extremely difficult to convince the Japanese to accept the appropriate change in overall limits. I'm nearly 16 minutes, but the whole point is treaties are complicated things to, uh, to go by weaponries because you're designing what you think is the great ship you, uh, you can build for now. And this is in the 1920s. By 1930s, your design needs might be different, and by 1940s, your design needs to be very, very different. That's the trouble with armor limitation by treaty. It makes a rod for your back as well as for the enemies. And that's a longer course as long as everyone obeys that. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed four random books. As I said, I am going to be starting recording more. Next week when I'm recording this, which is the 30th of August. And, well, you'll see what I record next week. Take care. Have fun and um, chatting. Bye. Thank you for a great year.